I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that does not bear, that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be ever more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Lord has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be <laughs> I lost it. Uh, oh, where, where was it? My command is that I love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no one, no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and anointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. This end is the word of God. Amen. Did you know that context matters? There was a farmer who was in, uh, in court because he had been injured in an accident with a, a driver of a trucking, trucking company, and he wasn't getting the, the, the compensation that he needed. They were um, stonewalling him, so he had to go to court. So in court that day, the, the trucking company had hired a hotshot young lawyer, and the first thing he did was put the farmer himself on the stand. And he said, Sir, on the day of the accident, did you or did you not tell the police officer who responded to the call, I'm fine. And the farmer said, well, let me think about that. On the day that, uh, uh, that the accident happened, I, I loaded up the old farm truck and I had my, my favorite mule, Bessie, in the back. And the lawyer said, no, 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 we don't care about Bessie. He said, on the day of the accident, did you or did you not tell the officer who responded to the call, I'm fine. The farmer continued. Well, old Bessie and I were headed to town, you know, there was a, we were going to the feed store and, and we were, you know, we were on our way and, stop, stop, your honor, would you please tell the witness to answer the question? You've been, you've seen the court, you know, you know how it works. I'm trying to prove that this man on the day of the, in fact, we know it from the testimony of the police officer, we're going to bring him up here in a minute, that on the day of the accident, he told the police officer that he was fine. This man is just trying to bilk the company, my client, out of money. So please, Your Honor, just instruct him to answer the question. Well, the, the judge looked and said, you know, I'd kind of like to hear about his old favorite mule, Bessie. And the farmer said, thanks, Your Honor, and he began to continue the story. He said, well, Bessie was in the back, and we were on our way to town, and the reason I was taking Bessie to town is we were going to the feed store, and, and there was a new feed, and, and Bessie's the one who eats it, so I wanted her to try it out to make sure that the feed was good for her. And anyway, we were driving along the road, and we got to that place where the, 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 it comes into a, a cross, and there was a stop sign, and, and we were going through it, and this truck just came out, ran the stop sign, and smashed into the side of the truck. He said, before I knew it, I, I was in the ditch, and I knew my leg was broken. I didn't know how bad I was messed up, but I knew old Bessie was in real trouble. She was laying in the ditch opposite me, and she was moaning and groaning, and I could tell she was in really bad shape. He said, so while I was trying to figure out if I could get myself around so I could check on Bessie, that's when the police officer drove up. And he got out of his car, and he went over to Bessie because she was making the most noise, and he looked down at her and he pulled his pistol 
out of his uh, holster, and he shot Bessie. And then he walked over to me. He said, Sir, your mule was in such terrible shape, I had to shoot her. How are you feeling? He said, Your Honor, it was at that point that I said, I'm fine. <laughs> Context matters. Context matters. Well, have you ever been with someone, and I know many of you probably have, when they are approaching the end of their life journey? They know before too long that they're going to be going to heaven, and, and, and that, that person calls you in and said, says to you, there is something that I want to tell you. These are their last words. Have you ever been at that place? And, you know, I imagine if you have, you will remember those words that they speak to you probably for the rest of your life because they're important. Now imagine that person is Jesus. Would you pay attention? Would what he has to say to you, would that be important? Would, be that, would that be something that you would remember? See, that's the context of our scripture today because context matters. In just 24 hours or less from the time that Jesus spoke these words, he would be arrested, he would be tried, he would be beaten, he would be crucified, and he would be laying in the tomb. Just 24 hours. You know, I imagine that, that uh, most of us like this passage. I am the vine, you are the branches, my father is the vine dresser, we know that. But I wonder how often we really understand the importance and the impact of these words because you see these were Jesus last words this was his last teaching to his disciple so the question is why here and why now or why now and why here why did Jesus do that because Jesus was always about abundant life and he was teaching his disciples some very important things I don't imagine at the time that they would remember them completely until later so let's get into it a little bit the setting Number one, if you're following with your notes tonight, it's Thursday night. Chapters 13 and 14 really lay out the setting pretty well. Do you know what it is? Well, it's Jesus and his disciples that have gathered together to celebrate the Passover feast, what we know as the Last Supper. So Jesus and his disciples are there. Just a few days before this time, there was the triumphal entry. Do you guys know about that? That was the time that Jesus rode in on the donkey and everyone was shouting, Hosanna! They were proclaiming him king and Messiah, and he was riding in. So here it was, and, and they're around this, this table, and it's, and it's a relaxed and it's a joyous atmosphere because in their minds they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, they knew it. They had seen it. They had witnessed it with their eyes, and, and this was perhaps the first time that they finally got it because Jesus had to make it pretty clear. I don't know. I, I think a lot of them are kind of like we are. And what I mean by that, and, I, and maybe not you, but I'm a little bit this way. I kind of, uh, kind of hear what I want to hear sometimes. And I kind of draw the conclusions that I want to draw. But John records the very moment when the atmosphere changed. So stay with me on this. The very moment it changes is Jesus, it says, arose from the table. He took off his outer garments. He girded himself with a towel. He wrapped a towel around himself, and he began to wash his disciples' feet. We, don't, we just read right through it in the Scripture, but this had to change. You have to realize what was going on in their minds. They were ready for Jesus to be Messiah, to, to, to wipe out the Romans, to bring God's kingdom on earth, right? That's where they were at. That was in their minds and hearts. Now, we know Jesus had been telling them differently, but that's what they had seen with their own eyes. They had witnessed that. So they were ready for this. And then the Messiah, the king, who's going to be king of the world, puts a towel on and he washes their feet, which is what the servant did. So you can just imagine the whole temperature in the room going down and the, they were looking at each other with question. Then it gets worse. Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. Uh, another level down. And then he goes, I am about to leave. I will soon be leaving you, and where I am going, you cannot follow. <sighs> and then he looks at Peter and says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows this morning. <sighs> Context matters. 
This is the atmosphere. Do you get it? Do you see it? These guys are at a place that they'd never been before. They were looking for Jesus to be king and, and to take them on. They were ready to lead the charge to take on the Roman Empire. And they realized during this time, for the, probably the first time, that it wasn't going to happen the way that they wanted it to happen. Jesus said to them, little children. <laughs> They felt like little children. They felt small and weak. I have loved you. They were staring at him in disbelief because they, they had ideas and plans and it just didn't quite fit into what they thought was going to happen. Let not your hearts be troubled. Yeah, right. You just dropped this monster bomb on us. Our hearts are definitely troubled. <laughs> I will not leave you orphans. They just felt like they had been totally abandoned. Where I'm going, you can't go. We want to go, Jesus. Well, the evening ends, and Jesus rises from the table, and he said, let us leave this place. So you have the setting? Do you have the mood? Things were totally different than when they walked into the room. And so they had gathered up the lamps or the torches and they're, they're winding their way to the Mount of Olives, to the garden that they'd been many times. And they're, they're avoiding crowds and they're walking among the lanes that are covered with grapevines. We've pretty well been able to trace at least possible routes and most of them have grapevines on either side of the road. And it's in the midst of that that Jesus pauses and says, I am the true vine. They didn't get it. There's no reason they would. Their world had just been dashed. Their, their hearts had been crushed. See, they were world, worried about world conquest, but Jesus was worried about discipleship life, what it truly means to be a disciple and to bear fruit. Most people love this passage, but I think very few really take into account the context, and it really does make a difference. I'm the true vine. My father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. I think a better translation, and we'll talk about this more next week, is he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is, and is withered, and they gather them up and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so proving yourself to be my disciples. So let's look at this today. This is number two with maybe a new perspective. I think we probably know this. It says Jesus is the vine. Well, the vine was a trunk. I mean, it looked, it was, they could get very thick. It was about 36 to 42 inches tall or long. And it ends in a big gnarled ball on top of that, which is where the branches grow from. The father is the vine dresser. He's the one whose job, well, I, I think you guys could probably figure it out. What it, the vine dresser kind of says it doesn't. What is the vine dresser's job? Take care of the vine. That's his one and only job. The vine dresser actually tends the vine, but his target is us to take care of, to, to help, to clean, to, to prune, to work with, to make more productive the branches because we guys are the branches we're the focus of the vine dresser each branch is propped up so it can get air circulation and sunlight moisture for ease of tending did you know that branches are cultivated individually you know we often think of farmers you know the big massive groups but in this day especially every branch got specific care from the vine dresser the vine dresser learned to know the branches and to know what they were capable of, and he gave individual care for the branches. So why here? Why now? 
Like I said, Jesus is always focusing on discipleship, and it's always about fruitfulness. You see, that's why he came. That's, that's why now Jesus didn't come to make Christians. Jesus came to make disciples. Do you know what I mean by that? Fruit-producing disciples. That's why Jesus came. I, I think we do a disservice to ourselves in the, in the church in the world today when we talk about making Christians. Jesus never said, go into all the world and make Christians. He said, make disciples. And I would submit to you that every Christian, everyone who enters into a relationship with Jesus Christ is a, is a Christian, but they're a disciple. They're a disciple. And Jesus is worried about us being fruit-bearing disciples. Fruit-bearing disciples. Well, what does fruit mean? We had started having this conversation the other night. What does it mean, fruit? I, I think that um, traditionally it's thought to mean souls for the kingdom or, or people coming to church or, or people who get plugged in and become a part of the body. But in the Bible, as I've done some research, the word fruit and good works are almost used interchangeably back and forth. Fruit and good works. In Titus 3.14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and live, live productive or live, not live unproductive or unfruitful lives. They would have remembered the passage from Psalms 3 when he started talking about fruitfulness. Or Psalms chapter 1, verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which brings its fruit in season whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The disciples would have understood, and, and, and we don't as much, that he was talking about being productive, fruitful, good works in life. And later as they thought through this, and they wouldn't have got it all at, the, at, at first, I don't believe, they would have understood that he was talking about discipleship, and he even gave them a hint right here that the true purpose of discipleship is bringing glory to God. John 15, 8, we read this. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, so proving yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus also told them in his teaching to imitate him. That's the true heart of discipleship, imitation, imitating his character and the fruits that reflect who he is. We know that passage from Galatians, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We need to reflect those things. When we do that, we reflect Him. And in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And then John 15, 16, You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go bear, what? Fruit. What kind of fruit? Fruit that will last. In Ephesians 2.10, we are, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, Jesus, in talking to his disciples this day, he wasn't there to make their dreams come true. You see, at this point, they pretty well realized that their dreams weren't going to come true. They were falling apart. We need to hear this. He works with us not to make our dreams come true. His goal is to work in us to make his dreams come true. Do you understand? The reason that God loves us and cares for us isn't to make our dreams come true. It's to make his dreams come true. Well, you would think something so important as this would happen automatically in the life of the disciple, but it doesn't really happen that way, does it? For a vineyard to really produce, the branches must respond to the care of the vine dresser. And the fact of the matter is, all branches, that's us by the way, respond differently. So how are you responding to the touch, to the care, to the leading, to the direction, to the guidance, to the nurture of the vine dresser? That's God, by the way. Well, number three, the purpose of vine dressing, fruit. It's pretty basic. 
the purpose of vine dressing is fruit. Sometimes I think that we can over-spiritualize this passage. At the bottom line, it's all about fruit. Now remember, our definition of fruit is this. Works that are pleasing to God, that bring Him glory. Works that make His dreams come true. And I think the idea of people coming to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior fits right into the middle of that, don't you? But it's larger than that because God wants us to grow and to prosper. And the vine dresser knows, God knows what each one of you are capable of, what each one of us are capable of. So let's go into the vineyard for just a couple minutes and look at some of the branches. And so imagine with me, you walk into the first row, and here is a branch, and there's a basket under the branch. And you go up to take a look at what kind of production is coming off this branch. Well, the first one has nothing in it. The first one's completely empty. It says, every branch in me that bears no fruit. Did you know that there are some branches connected to the vine that don't bear any fruit? That doesn't seem possible, does it? I mean, but Jesus says it right here. We're going to address that next week a bit because I, I've got to tell you that, that that's not God's intention, that we bear no fruit. But there are some branches that are connected to the vine, that love Jesus, that are receiving that nourishment, that don't bear fruit. Well, let's move on to the next basket. There's another basket, and, and in this one, there's a few bunches of grapes down in the bottom. It says, every branch that bears fruit. That's encouraging. I mean, at least there's some fruit in there. I guess some fruit is better than no fruit. Now, remember, we're not talking about evangelism now. We're talking about disciple life. We're talking about becoming what Jesus wants us to become. Well, let's move on to the next basket. The next basket has more fruit. Jesus says that there will be more fruit. God has a plan for each branch, and we're going to talk about that over the next couple of weeks so that we can produce more fruit. We may be satisfied with where we are, but God never is. It is, all, it is his goal that all branches would be fruitful, much and bear much fruit. Well, the last basket, by now you understand, is, is overflowing. It says it bears much fruit. This is what the vine dresser is working for in each one of us, that we would bear much fruit. God wants us, designed us, destined us for fruit. And all that he does in this context is to help us be more fruitful. That's his purpose. That's his goal. You know, we get caught up in a lot of stuff in the church even in the Christian life. and In fact, many of us might get stuck right here. Jesus never intended this to separate the haves from the have-nots. Because I know there's story after story of people who started here and ended up here with a, a wonderful, abundant, super abundant life. But I've got to tell you this morning that each one of us was created for abundance. God created us for abundance. Jesus teaches us that we can move as disciples from fruitlessness to superabundance. There was a church survey. Here was the question. How is your church doing at producing fruit? This question went out, the survey went out to many, 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 many churches. In one half of the churches, the answer was this. Our church is producing no fruit. No fruit. One third of the churches said we're producing a little fruit. Less than 5% of all the churches that were surveyed said that they're producing a lot of fruit, an abundance of fruit. Now remember our definition. We're not just talking about evangelism, although that's a part of it, but we are talking about people who are growing in discipleship life, becoming more like Jesus, showing up in good works, Living lives in such a way that it makes God's dreams come true for you. What would that look like? What would it look like? Well, now you know what I'm going to do, right? Let's think about our church. If that survey came to us, how would we answer? Don't answer <laughs> out loud. What would you say? How we are producing fruit. Zero? A little? More? 
or a superabundance of fruit. Okay, let's take it away from the church because the church is made up of individuals. How are you doing as a branch? What kind of fruit is showing up in your life? A little? More? A lot? I've got to ask, are you satisfied with where you're at? Or do you want more? As we go on this journey together over the next few weeks as we head toward Easter, we're going to discover just how incredible God's plan is for us. These last words of Jesus to his disciples and consequently to us disciples are the secret to becoming the fruitful disciples that he wants us to be. So what does your basket look like? What is your level of fruitfulness? What would you like it to be? Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you for this simple word today. And I pray that as we go on this journey to the cross, this journey to Easter, we, we started just a, a week or so ago and we're counting down. I think it's 30 days today until Easter. My prayer is that we would listen to your voice, particularly with regard to this passage, these last words of Jesus spoken to his disciples and recorded so that us as disciples today could hear them and respond to them and realize just how important they really are. Father, help us to examine our lives. Holy Spirit, speak to us and let us know where we stand on this. Because I would say that probably most all of us here are connected to the vine. We're, we, have, we are disciples, we love Jesus, and we've, we've become a part of his family. But Father, two things. I, are we satisfied with where we are and our level of fruit production in our lives? But more importantly, Father... Are you satisfied? Please speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.